Hello and welcome back. In this session we're going to turn from our introduction to online corpus search tools to a consideration of how corpora have been used in different branches of linguistics. Here we look at one of the first and most important applications of corpus-driven language study, lexicography, or the making of dictionaries. In this session, then, we we'll look at the ways in which corpus linguistics has changed lexicography in the last 40 or so years. We ask how lexicographers make use of corpus tools like concordance searches. And we look at what goes into a dictionary definition in the corpus era. Before we launch into this session, I want to consider what lexicography was like before corpora. The photograph on this slide is of the early days of the Oxford English Dictionary. In what he called his scriptorium, we can see the Oxford English Dictionary editor, James Murray, and his assistants. You can't see it, but it's so cold that they have their feet in boxes of straw to keep them warm. They're sifting through slips of paper sent in by a network of volunteers who are reading through a physical corpus of books and noting down interesting words or interesting senses of words. Murray and his assistants are compiling and supplementing this information and putting it into the dictionary. The job takes decades to accomplish. Murray was employed in 1879 and the first edition of the OED was published in 1928, 13 years after Murray's death. OED is a dictionary based on evidence from this physical corpus of books that have actually been read by editors, assistants and volunteers. It is etymological in its organisation. That is, if you look at this entry for the Chinese loanword kowtow, you will see that the first sense of the word, a, is based on the earliest citations found in written English, which, not surprisingly, are in travellers' accounts of China. The organisation of a typical OED entry includes quite a lot of information. It includes the term you want to define here, kowtow. It's part of speech, it's a noun. It's pronunciation, variant spellings, if any. It's etymology or original meaning, which means a knock on the head in Chinese. A definition for every sense of the word and a list of citations that both give evidence for this sense and illustrate its use. The OED is a fantastic achievement, completed long before the computer age. It's rightly regarded as a heroic enterprise. But does it give us everything we want from a dictionary? What do different readers want? Do they really want the etymological meaning of kowtow? What do language learners want? Well, maybe they want to know how the word is used today. Maybe they want to know if it's used in speech and writing frequently enough to be worth learning by heart. Maybe they want to know the words and phrases that commonly go with kowtow. These are things that corpora can tell us more easily and accurately than a network of volunteer readers. This is the dictionary that changed everything. Published in 1987, the Collins Cobuild Dictionary used what is now considered to be quite a small corpus, only 20 million words, to inform its selection of words and senses. After Cobuild, dictionaries were never the same again. Susan Hunston, in her 2002 book, Corpora in Applied Linguistics, notes that corpora allow today's lexicographers to do things that were not possible in the earlier part of the 20th century, even for those heroic people in James Murray's scriptorium. In particular, lexicographers can now give much more information about different senses of each word, since they have much more data at their fingertips. They can give more accurate information about the frequency of occurrence of each word and phrase. They can give more detailed information about collocates and phraseology, in other words, what words are the terms to be defined found alongside. And they can claim that their citations for each sense are authentic, especially if they are drawn from the corpus data. Although, as we shall see, there is some controversy about the use of corpus data in illustrating the senses of words. Let's think about these topics one by one. Let's begin with the different senses of the term to be defined. 
A very common word in English is the verb know. If you go into your library and find a pre-Covil dictionary, you'll find a certain number of sentences listed. For example, the Longman Dictionary of 1987 lists 20 separate senses of the verb. The second edition of the Cobill Dictionary in 1995 lists over 30 senses. The Corpus Informed Longman Dictionary of 1995 lists over 40. And the current version of the Oxford English Dictionary lists 39 main senses plus a range of phrasal verbs with no. At the very least, then, the Corpus Revolution has cast a spotlight on the many different senses of common words. Much more nuance is now available to lexicographers. Before we move on, think of the impact of this explosion of senses on the page numbers in a paper dictionary. One way to offset the growing costs of paper dictionaries, of course, is to go online. The online Macmillan Dictionary, like its hard copy equivalent, is a corpus-informed reference work. It's particularly useful to English learners because it uses colour coding and stars to identify those words that are frequently used in the language. Thanks to corpus linguistics, we now know that 90% of English uses just 7,500 words. The many other words in the dictionary are used in the other 10% of occasions. So if you learn that core 7,500 words and their various senses, you should be able to understand 90% of the English that you encounter. Macmillan's dictionary codes these 7,500 words in red, with one, two and three stars showing you the most frequent vocabulary, like hope. You know automatically that this is a word worth memorising or including in your learning materials if you're a textbook writer. Kau tau, on the other hand, is an infrequent word, one of those words that there is not such an urgency to learn, perhaps. The meaning of this word in the Macmillan Dictionary might interest us, however, is not quite the same as sense A in the OED entry, and we'll come back to that shortly. There are other uses that lexicographers might make of frequency information. The form R-E-C-O-R-D may be a noun, record, or a verb, record in English. Which might come first in a dictionary? If you want to put the most frequently used form first, you can do a corpus search to find out if the noun is more or less frequent than the verb. We can, of course, do such a search quite easily with an online corpus like COCA. We do a list search and specify which version of RECORD we wish to search by specifying the part of speech, R-E-C-O-R-D dot part of speech, in square brackets. There should be no spaces. At the time of this recording, in early 2017, R-E-C-O-R-D is tagged in COCA as appearing almost 10 times more frequently as a noun than as a verb. As a noun, it appears 65,686 times in COCA. As a verb, it only appears 7,527 times. So, maybe a learner should encounter the noun before the verb. Maybe. It's also useful to a lexicographer to know the frequency of occurrence of particular senses of any word and how it combines in phrases and what its collocates are. If we do a concordance search on the BNC for kowtow, for example, we find around 14 examples of its occurrence. If we study the concordance lines, we find that there is often a negative sense to the use of the word in English. Refuse to kowtow, would never kowtow, would not allow to kowtow, and so on. This negative sense of kowtow in English informs the Macmillan Dictionary definition. There's a little tag indicating that the term is used to show disapproval. Kowtowing is not something that should be done, in English discourse at least. This definition of the word is quite unlike the central etymological sense shown earlier in the Oxford English Dictionary, to show extreme respect by touching the ground with one's head. The concordance lines from the BNC indicate that in English, the word more typically means to try very hard to please someone in a way that other people might find annoying. Now, I have seen Chinese students, a few of them at least, become quite outraged at this definition, 
finding it culturally disrespectful to the etymology of the word. But this is the kind of difference between central and typical senses of an expression that corpus linguistics can shed light upon. The final question that we're going to address today is how you illustrate a meaning with a quotation or citation. In the early days of corpus-driven lexicography, the idea was that the citations would be drawn from the corpus data. This practice, this quest for authenticity, goes back to Samuel Johnson's pioneering dictionary of the English language, published in 1755. Johnson's rather idiosyncratic dictionary took its citations from the literature that he favoured. He illustrates the adverb zealously with a verse from John Milton, the famous poet, for example. The Oxford English Dictionary would favour the earliest written record of the term that its lexicographers can attest. Later lexicographers worried about the unmediated use of corpus examples in their dictionaries. The compilers of the Cambridge International Dictionary of English, which is a corpus-based dictionary, nevertheless criticised the practices of the early co-build lexicographers in using corpus data for their citations. They say, most citations are unsuitable for a learner dictionary because they are too complex grammatically, contain unnecessary difficult words or idioms, or make culture-dependent allusions or references to specific contexts. Later lexicographers would pay attention to the corpus data, but try to make simple, accessible illustrations based on the data to support their readers' learning. Today's Cambridge Dictionaries Online, for example, illustrate the adjective zealous with a phrase that's quite simple, a zealous supporter of the government's policies. It's probably been informed by corpus examples, but those examples have been selected and perhaps the phrase has been simplified to illustrate the sense given. So what have we learned from today's session if we didn't know it before? Well, first of all, Dictionaries, and particularly dictionaries for language learners, have been revolutionized by corpus linguistics. Dictionaries now incorporate much more information about the different senses of words. They incorporate more information about the frequencies of usage in the language. And they incorporate more information about typical meanings from frequencies and collocations, as well as central meanings which are often drawn from etymology. And they include more information about phra phraseology, the grammatical constructions or combinations that a word falls into. And the citations that we find in corpus informed dictionaries draw on authentic corpus examples, although these are sometimes simplified or adapted for learner's use. Thanks very much indeed for watching.